The story about the successful Soviet economy is a fake. Let's prove it. What were the world's most popular household items and food products from the Soviet Union? If your answer includes vodka, black caviar, and Lada Niva, let's delve into the challenges of the Soviet economic system together. Residents of the USSR, mechanics and confectioners, geologists and carpenters, academicians and students, along with store directors, factory managers, and Moscow officials, will join us in our exploration. Though on paper, the Soviet Union claimed the second largest GDP in the world, recalculating the GDP per capita paints a different picture, ranking the USSR at 31st place globally. The rosy image of economic success was far from the truth. The most prominent problems within the Soviet economy arose from the production of goods intended for its citizens. Despite the massive production of tanks and missiles, the Soviet population faced shortages of basic necessities, such as socks and lingerie. It's not a joke. When you walk into the lingerie section of any department store, you start to get upset. Look, lingerie exists, but there is no good one on sale. For example, this baby doll is made of terrible synthetic fabric. It's completely impossible to wear. At the core of the Soviet economic system lay the denial of consumer subjectivity. The party treated its 280 million population as biological objects to be clothed and fed. Moscow's Gosplan crafted all-encompassing five-year plans, dictating every detail, even the number of toilet paper rolls, without considering the opinion of consumers. When reporting on so-called achievements, the executives boasted about the volume of products shipped but never declared about the satisfaction of customers. We understand that we have not yet done everything in order to fully meet the demand. In 1979, we plan to increase the output of footwear by 400,000 rubles. We produce 3 kilograms of caramel per resident of Moscow per year. Its annual turnover is 680 million rubles. The volume of annual trade turnover increased 50 times, from 400,000 to 20 million rubles. Disregarding the people's opinions had severe consequences, leading to a lack of focus on product quality in the modern sense. With no competition in the consumer market, many companies produced subpar or unappealing products. Soviet brands were notorious for producing goods that were both of low quality and expensive. Electronics and clothing in the Soviet Union were notably overpriced. Start with the examination of the state of salaries at that time. Previously, I had a salary of 110 rubles. Now I earn 165 rubles plus bonuses. On average, I receive 250 rubles a month. Due to the centralized nature of employment, with individuals being assigned to jobs, there was no competition among employers. As a result, salaries remained stagnant for decades. Let's take a look at how much a foreman of the assemblers at the Gorky automobile plant earned in 1984. I receive, on average, 250 rubles. Not a lot, not enough. If this was considered a high income, it begs the question of what constituted a low one. In the 1976 decree outlining salary increments at research institutes, it is evident that the director of such an institute received a monthly salary ranging from 210 to 270 rubles, while department heads received a minimum of 165 rubles. Caretakers received only 100 rubles. Now, let's check the prices of goods in stores. TVs 200, 300 rubles, and this is not the limit. We bought a Taurus TV. We like it. Previously, it cost 755 rubles, now it is 125 rubles cheaper. Vinyl players, from 200 to 1000. Zenith film camera 210 rubles. Furniture set 650 rubles. Wrist watch 60 rubles. Dresses, up to 80 rubles. Salespeople in the gum mall thought this price tag was a problem. Excuse me, in your opinion, as a shop assistant, what prevented buyers from buying this dress in the summer? I think the obstacle was the price of 81 rubles. For summer things it is too expensive. How much does it cost now? Now this dress costs 49 rubles. You can do the math to determine how many monthly salaries are required to refresh the wardrobe or purchase new electronics. By stating that the Soviet planned economy didn't prioritize consumers, I refer to the significant gap between steep prices and meager wages. This situation forced people to tirelessly search for affordable, yet high-quality products. 
people had to do the shopping for a long time. Which brings us to the next part of the problem, scarcity. Hear how long Soviet citizens couldn't buy an ordinary coat or boots, and how they explained it. Shoes. What? Men's boots. Why do you need men's boots? It's for my husband. How long have you been looking for boots? For a long time. Aren't there any good boots? Nothing at all. What would you like to buy? A raincoat. And what is the result? No suitable size. Either I'm too non-standard or they sew such clothes. How long have you been looking for a raincoat? It's been a whole year. I'm looking for a coat. And? Did not buy. Why? Because everything is expensive. Are the coats nice at least? Beautiful, but all expensive. How much is it? 350, 365. So we found the reason why the planned economy in the union remained ineffective. Brands produced a limited number of expensive items. In terms of the amount of goods shipped, the companies cope with the plan, but people did not have enough budget clothes and affordable electronics. Buyers complained about the poor quality of goods, about bad models. We told them that we are not to blame, but the producers. We have nothing to do with it. Then we tried to work with manufacturers, to find some kind of mutual understanding. And we realized that they, too, are being led down by suppliers. It would seem that brands are not to blame, the reasons for this situation are objective. But customers are suffering. Deficiencies and also encompassed logistic challenges. As you may know, the ministries in Moscow controlled rail transport across the nation. Consequently, issues in logistics sometimes hindered the shipment of goods, like when a shoe factory in Lviv encountered difficulties in delivering its products to stores. The successful work of our team is hampered by the indisposition of the railway workers, who systematically cut the number of containers. Since the beginning of the year, we have not received more than 1,200 containers. In other words, they failed to ship more than half a million pairs of shoes to the consumer. Warehouses are filled with products, and they have to be stored directly in the workshops. When it comes to the quality and cost of materials for producers, Soviet managers can offer better insights than I can. We can solve a number of problems with deliveries to retail chains. Some problems, for example, with the release of demi-season coats of ordinary quality, we cannot solve now. To increase our production, it is necessary to produce more fabrics that are in demand. I do not remember a single case in 30 years of work when the director of a clothing or shoe factory came to our shopping center and said, I want to buy a suit from my factory. The irony lies in the frequent disparities between the planned production figures and the actual output during the Soviet era. This fact was acknowledged even within Soviet times. During perestroika, when economic issues became more openly discussed, a telling display was set up at VDNKH in Moscow. It featured a Vesna tape recorder indicating the planned production for 1986 as 10,000 units, but the actual production reached only 305 pieces. The blame for the unmanageable nature of the Soviet planned economy falls on the leadership. As they say, fish rots from the head. Even a Moscow official conceded that the State Planning Commission failed to address the concerns of consumers, specifically car owners. If the State Planning Committee began to coordinate all issues and control the work of departments for the sale and maintenance of cars, we could solve many issues more successfully. And our car owners did not have to solve such issues that they are forced to solve now. No further comments seem necessary. The party elite in Moscow lived in a self-contained bubble, untouched by queues and shortages, making the deficit an abstract problem that could be indefinitely brushed aside. We have discovered that the lack of competition in the consumer market and the absence of incentives for brand development were prominent features of the Soviet Union. Brands had little reason to innovate as people were compelled to purchase whatever was available due to scarcity. Now, let's address how new equipment and products found their way into the Soviet Union. The answer may not please those who dream about Soviet times. The communist government relied heavily on imports from the West, encompassing food, electronics, clothes, and cars. The Union either bought production technology or produced Soviet fakes of Western products. The practice of producing unlicensed copies had long been established, resembling the pattern later seen in China. The insights of Anastas Mikoyan, the Minister or People's Commissar of the Food Industry,
provide valuable information on Soviet imports. During his 1936 visit to the United States as part of an official delegation, McCoyan observed various food processing and engineering plants. In his memoirs, he earnestly believed that Soviet industry would learn from the West and eventually develop its own production capabilities. He admitted that Soviet specialists learned cheesemaking techniques from Holland and Denmark, as well as dairy product packaging methods from Germany. However, a significant portion of technology was imported from the United States. The Union saw the introduction of several products in the 1930s due to imports from America and Europe, including Dr. Sausage, Bacon, Canned Juices, Canned Fish, Condensed Milk, Powdered Milk, Melted Cheese, the Eskimo Ice Cream, Sparkling Wines, and Cereals. Funny that, McCoyan introduced burgers to the Union, but they were referred to as, cutlets with a bun. The experience led to the establishment of burger machines and street roasters in several large cities. However, the Soviet version lacked essential elements like cheese, vegetables, and sauce, rendering the quick lunch less appetizing. As a result, the food failed to gain popularity and eventually disappeared from sale, leaving only the cutlet as an independent dish. The shortcomings of Soviet catering were evident even many years later, as a journalist from International Panorama noted the inability of Soviet establishments to properly spread mustard on a bun and prepare a thin, juicy cutlet, comparing it unfavorably to the offerings in New York. But the sandwiches are hot. Potatoes are delicious, lettuce is fresh. Just make sure to order. In a minute, your delicious lunch is ready. Eat for health. Flow, conveyor, factory. Remember, we had kitchen factories in the 30s. In the 50s we had house kitchens. Why didn't we continue this business and lose experience? The cutlet case sheds light on a significant problem with Soviet imports. Money was spent on purchasing technology without considering the outcome. In 1961, the Soviet Union acquired milk packaging machines in triangular packages from the Swedish company Tetra Pak. However, the paper bags shaped like tetrahedrons had a flaw, causing a reported 1% milk loss due to damaged packaging in warehouses and shops. Swedish designers acknowledged the error and abandoned the tetrahedra in 1969. Despite the experience with triangular milk bags, the Soviet government did not invest in improving existing technology. Consequently, triangular milk bags persisted until the collapse of the USSR. Throughout the 50s to the early 90s, Soviet citizens had a demand for household appliances. Soviet manufacturers routinely copied Western designs for refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, tape recorders, and video recorders. It's interesting that the isolated Soviet Union imported Western standards where it was not obligatory. Instead of creating superior technology to compete with the West, Soviet industry often settled for producing replicas. For instance, in 1967, the Kharkov Proton plant released a Soviet version of the 1963 Philips audio cassette, while in 1969, the first Soviet compact tape recorder Desna emerged, essentially a fake version of the Philips L3300, which had been released five years earlier. The preference for the original over a copy is well understood, and some Soviet citizens were willing to pay exorbitant prices for imported electronics. In the mid-1950s, the Thaw arrived in the USSR, leading to a brief period of improved relations with Western countries. In 1957, the World Youth Festival brought 100,000 foreigners to Moscow, exposing Soviet citizens to something entirely new. People of Moscow discovered that young people abroad wore jeans and sneakers, such as Converse. In the mid-60s, Soviet industry created a replica of Converse shoes. Later, in 1979, licensed production of Adidas sneakers commenced in Moscow, requiring the country to import materials and equipment from Germany. The West German company Adidas produces sportswear. It is also one of the best manufacturers of sports shoes. We received pads under a contract. We also received the shoe production technology. Adidas recommended the equipment that we purchased. Jeans quickly turned into a luxury item in the Soviet Union, with people willing to pay hundreds of rubles for authentic American trousers. Selling imported clothing was a lucrative yet risky venture with counterfeit sellers facing severe consequences, including death penalty. Nonetheless, the activity in the shadow market remained undiminished. In an attempt to take control, the communist government could only produce trousers made of blue cotton fabric, calling them jeans. The real Soviet jeans emerged in the 1980s after the import of Indian denim machines, a hundred years after the creation of the first Levi's.
We didn't have good fabric. We have well-qualified workers, smart machines, and proven technologies. Now we have solved the problem by obtaining an excellent orbit of fabric, which is not inferior to foreign analogs in its density and structure. Now we can do the job better. The one particular example of imports vividly illustrates the inadequacies of the Soviet economy. In 1978, the USSR sought to produce Pepsi, but lacked the funds to purchase the necessary concentrate from the United States. Likewise, the American company was unwilling to invest in Soviet enterprises. The Communist Party found an awesome solution by offering vodka to the PepsiCo concern in exchange for the concentrate required to manufacture soda. The Soviet system skillfully deceived people, and its propaganda constantly boasted of so-called achievements in the economy. In a 1981 episode of the Vremya Nightly News, they proudly showcased the new Vyatka 12 washing machine. For its production, special workshops were built at the Elektrobipribor plant. Such high-performance equipment has been installed. Load the machine with 4 kilograms of clothes, choose one of 12 programs. Upon closer inspection, the fake became apparent. The presence of inscriptions in Italian at the Soviet enterprise and the manager's evasiveness raised suspicions. It turned out that the Vyatka 12 was not a new Soviet creation but a 10-year-old Italian model of Ariston. The evidence was undeniable. A selector in a rounded rectangle, 12 modes, a rectangular toggle switch, a square button, a grill on the tray cover, and a pedal handle on the door. The Soviet propaganda, it seems, was counting on the fact that no one would ever uncover the truth about the use of old Italian technology. The illusion of a successful Soviet economy has been exposed. The interests of Soviet consumers were disregarded by Gosplan officials. A centralized plan from Moscow dictated production tasks to ministries and factories. Soviet citizens were forced to endure a constant discrepancy between their expectations, the prices they paid, and the quality of the goods they received. This unsustainable system couldn't hold for long. The moment the Communist Party allowed imports, Soviet citizens eagerly embraced Japanese VCRs, German cars, and American clothes. This clear evidence indicates that the Soviet planned economy brought about its own downfall. Thank you for watching this video till the end. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to stay tuned for more stories about life in the land of the Soviets.